Everybody, how you doing? July 14th, Bastille Day. Viva la France. Uh, ITK Radio, Mark Ross. I'm here with Stephen Majors. Stephen, how are you today? What's happening? Doing great, Mark. Thanks for having me. Didn't realize it was Bastille Day, so... Uh, oh, you're not, a fr- you're not a Francophile? You're not a, you're, not, you're not a Macron fan? Well, uh, I mean, I was we just in Paris with my wife a couple months ago, and we loved it, but um, I guess I haven't memorized my French holidays. <laughs> Yeah, I've uh, I've never seen my wife happier when she's in Paris. So it's always it's always good to take the wife to Paris every now and then. Indeed. Um, I hadn't. It was funny speaking of Paris. I hadn't been there to like my like my forties, my early forties. I was always kind of indifferent, and you know, I thought I'd get there eventually. But when I was there, I was like, wow, I really understand it. This is a pretty pretty cool scene. Yeah, I don't know if you had the same same reaction. For sure. I mean, I hadn't been since I was in college. And that, of course, is a different experience than when you're kind of uh, in your early 40s um, and you and you take your <laughs> wife. But uh, I had heard for several years from my wife that I had not taken her to Paris. And so finally, I uh, I did that. So There you go, man. Good husband. Love it. All right. Let's jump right into it. You've got a very interesting, I think, classic communications background, um, much more so than me. I think like you actually studied it. You have a journalism background, you've practiced it, and now you're giving advice. So uh, you've seen it from all sides. Uh, can you just give people from a macro perspective what it's like to be a reporter and mm-hmm. how how people should interact with reporters? From a, do you have any dr- general rules of thumb around that? Sure. Yeah. No, no small topic to start off with. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would say, you know, I spent the first six or seven years of my career as a reporter. And uh, it, it's it's a really great experience. Um, obviously, it's a high metabolism job. You're really forced to learn things quickly, um, under deadline, under pressure. Really, kind of cut through all the the noise and extraneous material and, and focus on what's really important. And so, um, I, I think when and ideally, and I hope that as a on the other side of things as a communications professional, I kind of learn and remember. Um, what it was like to be a reporter when I'm interacting with reporters. Um, and I think the important things are, of course, to, to be brief, to be to the point, um, to help them really think through what a story could be. And most importantly, when you're pitching, you know, make sure you're pitching to the right people. Because when I was a reporter, you know, covering state government, state politics in, in Florida and Ohio, I used to get pitches that had nothing to do with state government or politics. And that, of course, drives you a little bit nuts. And so... I think it requires research. It requires kind of tailored messaging. Um, you have to anticipate kind of what a reporter is looking for. And I think it fundamentally you need to be, you need to respect what they do, um, which I certainly do having, having done it myself. Um, and, you know, every time you're interacting with reporters, you just need to kind of demonstrate that respect and that they have a job to do. You have a job to do. Um, and you treat each other with a respect and, and hopefully help each other along the way. No, that's really good. Yeah, sound advice. I, I like that point you made as well, that you say not a reporter or as an expert or a business owner or, you know, an elected official, that you really have an opportunity not to, like, to educate or shape, but share stories or really provide insight that a reporter might not have. Because uh, I also imagine two reporters at any given day, depending on what is happening in the world, you may wake up and think, oh, I'm going to do this. But, you know, two hours later, something else could happen that changes your whole day and you, you know you've got to get really smart on a topic really quick so that idea of like being an expert and sharing intelligence with a reporter is really sound advice yeah i think that's right because you're you're constantly trying to even when you're on a beat you're constantly learning new things um and so you most value it when people can really help you cut to the chase get to the main points um kind of help you. And obviously, you know, on the comm side, there's, there's, there's a point of view that you're trying to communicate, but um, as much as you can help with, with facts and just context, even if it's on background, I think that's really valued. Can you share it too? Like, yeah, yeah, I like that you mentioned that idea of like a beat reporter. You know, I, I remember I was doing some work and this guy at the journal, Wall Street Journal, like all he did was General Electric, right? Cause gee, he's such a massive organization, but Every day, that's all he reported on was General Electric. And this idea, like you were doing state government, local government, or vis-a-vis like a columnist or a financial writer. Um, can you just talk about trying to really understand what the reporter is covering? Or are there questions that people should ask? Like, 
hey, can you tell me exactly what you're working on so I can be more useful to you? Yeah, I think it's good. I mean, one of the first questions I always ask when I'm talking to a new reporter from the comm side is like, tell me about your beat. What are the stories that you're hoping to cover? You know, how much background do you have? And that gives me an idea of like kind of level of knowledge and where I need to kind of ground um, kind of my, you know, the, the information that I'm tr trying to convey. Um, and so I think beat reporters tend to have, obviously, if they have the narrow, more narrow the beat, the more specialized their knowledge is. And the more general the beat, um, it, there's kind of a lot more education that, that needs to occur. Right. So like even in the current world I'm in, but let's say, let's call it biotech, pharma, um, life sciences, et cetera, it's such a huge, it's a beat, but it's such a huge beat that um, <laughs> there's still a lot of specialized knowledge to convey um, in our kind of little corner of the world in cell and gene therapy. Yeah, I want to talk to you. Yeah, I, that's definitely something I want to dig in. Like, mm -hmm. how do you make, you know, this really interesting world of biotech accessible? But I, I'm curious, like, how did, when did you decide to make the leap to say the other side or go more advisory, more strategy? Mm -hmm. um, are you are you surprised that you're still not a reporter? Or is this kind of <laughs> where you thought you would be? Or um, I guess being several years out now, I'm not surprised, but I'm still surprised given kind of where I started and kind of, you know, going from, from high school into college and then choosing my college, at least partly based on the fact that I had a great journalism program. Um, so you were doing like, even in high school, you were doing like the high school newspaper and all that? High school newspaper. Yeah. Cause I, oh, wow. I always Amazing. gravitated towards writing. I always yeah. gravitated towards current affairs. I kind of knew that's where my greatest strengths were. Um, and so, and <laughs> not science, which is interesting. And we'll come back to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, so I, I went to college presuming I was going to be a journalist for my career. And I think you quickly learn that, um, especially this day and age, the thing that you think you're going to do for the rest of your life at age 18 or 20 is highly unlikely to be the thing that you're still doing when you're 40. Um, so went to college, you know, studied journalism, uh, also political science, uh, spent several years as a reporter, mainly covering government politics, Florida and Ohio, really interesting stuff, but also, you know, this, the stuff that AP reporters do from, you know, uh, storms that show up, hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, right. criminal justice, kind of everything across the map. Um, and then I had always been interested in public policy, um, and politics. And I think a certain part of me at some point was like, well, I, I've done this journalism thing. I think I want to see what things are like from a different vantage point. And so went to um, public policy school, international affairs at um, University of Maryland and kind of went from there, kind of got involved in geopolitical risk and political risk for a while. Uh, ended up on the business development side of things, which has some some similarities to comms, which we can get into um, if you want to take it there. And then ultimately kind of found an opportunity to get back to my roots on the public affairs side on comms and working directly with media. And, and that's kind of where I am now. So it's one of those careers where you can't really see uh, or foresee where things are going to go. And you just kind of follow and see where the opportunities come up and um, yeah, it's it's just an interesting thing how things have turned out, but I'm I'm really happy where I am. Yeah, it's interesting because I want to talk to you about like public policy communication, especially. Uh, yeah, it's interesting you studied you know poli sci in undergrad, and obviously in grad school you get more serious about it. Um, I often ref wrestle with, and maybe you find this, or I, I just think you need to have like a philosophical understanding of economics or political system, especially when you start doing. Uh, I think public policy communications because you really need to know both sides of it and have a theoretical understanding of you know Keynes and Hayek or whatever like different political systems and how have you found that to be the same thing and then if you do how do you stay on top of it I mean do you still have a large media diet or are you just digesting a lot of stuff watching a lot of obscure documentaries by yourself in the basement or you know how do you <laughs> continue to stay on top of the public policy stuff yeah I uh you know th there's that of course that debate between is it better to be an expert in one thing or a couple things, or is it better to be that kind of wide ranging uh, thinker? And there's that, of course, pretty well known book range um, that talks about the benefits of having a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different knowledge on, uh, you know, a lot of different topics. 
Um, and maybe because, because it describes me, I prefer the, the range uh, approach. And that's certainly been the case in, in my career. Um, and I found that the ability to understand politics, economics, international affairs, and then now kind of getting more of an understanding on the biotech side and on science to be able to combine all of that to understand the complete external context that you're operating in. I think that's a, a huge advantage. Um, and so I spend most my media diet now on a day-to-day -day basis is very heavily biotech because I, I need to follow that for my job to understand what's going on. But I certainly still consume a lot of general political news, uh, international affairs, like the, that interest in geopolitics and international affairs will always be there. Um, and it's, it's still relevant in some ways to my work, but a lot of what I read is just because I still remain personally interested in it. Yeah, and I think, too, I find, like, politicians in Helsinki are like politicians in Columbus, Ohio. You know, there's certain mm -hmm. traits politicians maintain regardless of, you know, where they are in the world. Right. Um, I'm interested, yeah, you mentioned this idea. I mean, obviously, you're really skilled at kind of communications, writing, strategy, resource, or researching. And then, but you said you weren't, like, a biotech, like, life science expert. But, I, I mean, me personally, sometimes I find it's valuable to not be so smart on a topic when you do comms because I like my idea is like I want to make this accessible to these different audiences so if, if I'm doing this every day and I don't understand it how am I going to explain this to somebody you know back in Columbus Ohio I mean do you wrestle with that that kind of balance between yeah being an expert versus like listen I'm really good at telling stories around communications absolutely um and then the good news is i don't ever have to worry about being an expert compared to most people i work with <laughs> many of whom who have phds in biochemistry so i'm, no, I'm in no danger of uh <laughs> being too much of an expert on that topic um but that said like you do learn enough about the basics of the science um and we know when i have to describe what cell and gene therapy is the examples like I'm describing the stuff that I've had to learn as a someone who hasn't taken formal science, you know, since high yeah. school. And so I think you're right. That is kind of a built in advantage when you're in comms because I'm communicating with reporters, I'm communicating with policymakers. And these are also people that don't have PhDs. And so um, even, you know, despite not having a PhD, I can still communicate information that they don't know. And then I can help our are really talented, you know, PhD experts in the science, um, break things down in a way that is accessible to your average audiences. What's your, yeah, I definitely want to talk to you how you think about audiences, but um, let's talk about like working with your colleagues or yeah, uh, taking like a PhD intellectual, somebody who's been studying this topic for, you know, 20, like dedicated their whole life to it, 25 mm -hmm. years or whatever, and then giving them communication advice or media training for lack of a better word, um, do you have like tactics that you use with your colleagues to say, you know, here, I'm here to help you break this down or help me, you know, break this down. Can you just talk about that kind of go between, between mm -hmm. you and the audiences and your, your colleagues? Sure. I would say, um, I mean, it, this is probably not something groundbreaking or new, but often if I'm talking, whether it's an expert in, um, the science side or someone who's really kind of granular on the policy side. If I'm trying to get them to explain things in a way that I can understand or a reporter can understand, I'll say like, you know what, just pretend like you're at Thanksgiving dinner, you're talking to one of your family members, they're not yeah, in perfect. this industry, like how, yeah, I love that. how would you go about explaining this? And that kind of gives you a grounding or a foundation to work off of. Um, Cause I think it's really, and, th and then jargon of course, and acronyms, it, that's a, a challenge in the policy world and it's a challenge yeah. in the scientific world as all well, as well so you really have to pull people out of their kind of context um to to get them to be better communicators with other folks um and like you know we're or and i'm not immune to that as well like the more time i spend kind of around uh cell and gene therapy therapy experts in our world like I do have to remind myself as well when I'm talking to other audiences uh, to, to talk about it in a way that's um, kind of the, the basic building blocks. So I think it's something we all struggle with. No, I love that. Like for me, like, yeah, I think about like, who am I trying to talk to? I'm trying to talk to like my buddies, like Oakland County, Michigan, you know, they've got good jobs, they're well-educated, they've traveled a bit, like, you know, they're, they've got management positions. 
but they're not deep in this policy. So I think having that like person that you can visualize who you're talking to is that's a really great advice. And then I, I would, how do you find like the policy stuff? Cause I do like most of the day, you know, you're on Capitol Hill, you're dealing with different agencies, a lot of smart, interesting people at the same table. And sometimes language is used and acronyms and inside knowledge is used to kind of keep other people at the table or shaping out this policy to kind of size each other up. It's almost a bit of a, uh, you know, sword match, if you will, it gives a bit of strategy. And then when you get out of that space, you got to talk to somebody in St. Louis about mm -hmm. this stuff. Um, yeah, it's a good check to be like, listen, this is a different audience. I've got to change my cadence, if you will. Right. Exactly. Do you find, um, how do you wrestle with like the biotech life science stuff? I guess there's this idea of like, you know, being very vertical, right? Or you talked about range, like you can go mm -hmm. one way or horizontal. Um, and your work now, are you, you're covering a whole spectrum of life sciences and biotech, or is it like vertically focused? Yeah, so I would say it's more vertically focused. So we're like a sliver of the biotech sector. So it's um, genetic medicines, engineered cell therapies. Um, so these are therapies for uh, rare genetic diseases, therefore, um, you know, blood cancers, uh, some other therapies in the pipeline for kind of more prevalent diseases. Um, and so they're all kind of grouped together in the cell and gene therapy space. And so these are kind of live medicines using kind of living cells, genes, um, that sort of thing. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, but some of the, the same things that apply to biotech apply to cell and gene therapy, but it's also so different than other types of medicines that we're constantly trying to communicate about how here are the ways that it's similar, here are the ways that it's different. And because it's so different, you can't put it in the same box as you've put monoclonal antibodies or vaccines or other types of therapies that have come before it, uh, both from a scientific perspective and then, you know, crucially a policy perspective as well. Um, so. Yeah, I'm wondering how did, you mentioned you, you've done some kind of classic biz dev communications, business development, communication, marketing. Mm -hmm. How has that helped or hindered your policy, public policy communications? Like what lessons have you learned from that kind of more B2B kind of communications versus, you know, I guess B2P, I don't know. We need a new a new acronym <laughs> for uh, business policy communications. Yeah, um, I mean, I think with business development, it, it's all about audience, right? So business development's about communicating a certain value proposition to an audience um, using examples. Um, public policy communication is about communicating the value proposition of cell and gene therapy to particular audiences using examples. Um, and so there are, I mean, the business development, I think a core requirement for being good at business development is being a good communicator and understanding your audiences. Um, you know, and some people do that through simply being kind of a, um, honest broker of the information. Um, other people have kind of that more traditional kind of personality you think of when you think of sales. Some people right. have both. And so I think there are different ways to be effect effective at both communications and business development based on kind of your individual personality um, traits or strengths. Yeah, this is, I want to, yeah, hone in on audiences. You mentioned that. I'm curious, of, well, two things, like how do you think about audiences in general? And then, I mean, my experience sometimes, you know, we have bosses or board members that are like, they want every, they want just, they're just obsessed with the metrics, if you will, like the, the size and, you know, and wrestling with like, listen, that that audience may be big, but it doesn't, it's not going to help us move the ball or like, we really got to be focused on this person or this elected official or this agency. Um, can you talk about just those two parts of like audiences you develop and then really trying to say, listen, let's stay focused. This is who we really care about. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> the, yeah. Cause I, I think you have to be tailored and purposeful about the type, type of audience you're trying to reach in the, in the communication that you're doing. And so, you know, when we're looking at, at media coverage, um, we know that there are certain outlets that hold a lot of authority in our space and right now tech specifically. And then we know there are certain out, audio or outlets that really hold a lot of sway just in the broader kind of public. And so, in some cases, we want to be in certain publications because we know that our member organizations read that. We know that certain policymakers read that. 
In other cases, we want to be in a publication because as we start to try to make the broader public aware of cell and gene therapy, we know that that is one of the best ways to reach them. Um, but also with fragmentation being what it is in the media landscape, um, you know, the certain media outlets are not held as an not held as in such high esteem as they were before. And so you also have to look at other channels. You have to look at your social channels. You have to look at, um, you know, social media outlets in general as a way to deliver your message directly. And so I think it's just become a lot more complex when you're thinking about audiences, but it always has to start with like, what is the specific audience we're trying to reach? And are we focused on trying to get a specific policy outcome? And if so, like which publication should we focus on? Or are we focused on creating broader awareness of what this technology could do for patients? And if so, what's the best outlet for that? Yeah, I love that. So it's really starting from like basically asking, like, what are we trying to accomplish? And then what are the best vehicles to make that a reality? Can, exactly. can you chat about um, how you think about um, owned media, for lack of a better word, like using the different organizations you've worked with, like how you think about using social how do you think about content you all produce, whether it be annual reports, white papers, issue briefs, podcasts, con mm -hmm. uh, events, conferences? Um, is that becoming more important, less important? Is it the same as it always is around creating your own content, if you will? Yeah, I would say it's become, generally speaking, it's become more important um, because with the media fragmentation that I just mentioned um, and with kind of trust in, in certain media falling um your own content is, is more and more important as a way to to establish your brand um and so your own organization's content whether that be through social media or through um executive engagements that you're doing speaking engagements annual reports all of those things help to raise your profile and enable you to deliver your message directly unfiltered to specific audiences um, but they also are the things that are going to get you noticed by kind of the, those more traditional media audiences, media gatekeepers. Um, and so they kind of have a self-reinforcing cycle to them. Um, and uh, social media is, is kind of, it's very useful because you get almost instantaneous feedback on the content right. that lands and the content that doesn't. And that's that's that does not happen, of course, when you when you, you know, get your organization's name in a particular media outlet. You don't quite know what happens after that. Can you talk about um, if you do this, like, do you do you have an editorial calendar, you and your team? And then do you think about content like daily, weekly, you know, quarterly? And then do you, how do you set up to make sure you're not being always reactive, that you're also being a bit responsive or almost anticipating what the media, what people are going to care about, whether it's policy officials or audiences you care about. Can you just talk about that general big question? Sure. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> certainly there's uh, there's parts of this job where things happen, you just have to react. Like that, that's the same as being a reporter. You go into a day with a plan, that plan gets derailed. Uh, but the thing that happens is so important that you you go in that direction. Um, but there's also, of course, a lot, a lot of opportunity to help get, to, to get ahead of things. And so... You know, we know um, kind of what uh, the general time frames for when certain therapies are going to get approved by FDA or the European Medicines Agency um, or, uh, you know, other regulatory decisions, other kind of legislation that's moving through Congress or uh, the European Parliament that's going to affect biotech and cell and gene therapy. Right. And so we can kind of get ahead and start getting making sure reporters are aware of these deadlines, like helping anticipate the types of stories they're likely to be interested in, and then figuring out how we're going to um, play into those storylines and how we can supply data that's going to be useful to those stories. Um, and so we build kind of our media engagement around that. We build our kind of social engagement around that. And so there is a lot that you can do uh, by planning it ahead and knowing kind of what the key turning points uh, for their sector are, are likely to be. Um, yeah, as we wrap up here, I'm, uh, two more uh, just kind of ideas that came to me or questions I want to ask about. Um, obviously, you, you work currently for a membership organization that's global in its scope. So can you, you just talk about what it's like to work with obviously leading uh, communications advocacy for the organization, but also the interplay between your member companies and 
uh, that approach, like working with the comms team back at HQ and, um, you know, the, the special uniqueness that it is mm-hmm. when you work at a trade association of building, you know, keeping up with the same page when you've got companies that may be competing against each other. Right, of course. So, yeah, I mean, we are we are global. Um, we are a membership organization. We have, you know, uh, members that are large companies, large biotech companies, small biotech companies. Uh, we've got patient advocacy organizations. We've got academic medical research institutions. So there's a lot of different and, and that's what makes us special. We're a multi-stakeholder advocacy organization. And so there's a lot of um, viewpoints uh, there, you know, and we, we do a lot of work to align our members around certain advocacy positions that we take. And so, um, I try to do my best to, to stay engaged with, uh, all of the latest news with our members organizations. Um, and then to, to stay in touch with their communications teams around kind of upcoming approvals, the way that our organization can be helpful in amplifying particular messages, um, things that, we as a membership organization can have an effective voice on as kind of the voice of the sector uh, vis-a-vis kind of individual member companies. Um, And then of course there's differences between Europe and the U S that we have to keep in mind as well. Difference in kind of the the political environments, the uh, types of publications you're trying to reach. Um, So there's a lot of different kind of fast moving dynamics that you have to stay on top of. Yeah, and since you are the, uh, you, you have a global, like your brief, your remit is the world uh, as a global comms director, um, and you're working at these different levels, state, national, uh, global. I mean, can you just talk about how you keep that all straight yourself? Like, what what, uh, what have you learned, or how do you, are you trying to revise that, or uh, <laughs> what kind of, um, how do you modify that? Or what's any insights or expertise you can share to, you know, hey, I want to work in the world. How can I do this better? <laughs> Yeah, it, it definitely gets complex and it's always, um, it, you know, you're trying to kind of turn things up and down depending on, on what's happening and you're responding to events. I think um, going back to what I was saying before, I think this is one of the things where it's helpful to have kind of exposure to a lot of different topic areas, um, you know, to, to kind of understand the international perspective, to understand how Europe works, but then also understand how kind of a, a state policymaker in, in Texas or Ohio or, or wherever it might be um, is going to work. And you have to kind of split your time and then tailor when things need tailoring and speak to audiences from, you know, where they are um, and what their political views might be. Um, and then there are times where the message that you're delivering is going to be the same across, you know, state, national, international. And so I think it, it's kind of an constant, uh, constantly reappraising um, you, what your messages are and then how they can be tailored to those audiences and then when they can actually be combined. Yeah. As we, as we wrap up here, can you just talk about your experience too, like messaging, obviously messaging to Brussels, um, maybe different or maybe heard differently and say Austin, Texas. And can you just talk about how you wrestle with like, listen, we got to be consistent on this message mm-hmm. and maybe interpreted different um, or we need to be more nuanced. So people in Austin hear this differently than they do in Brazil. Uh, can you just chat about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I I think you just need, you need to constantly remember kind of who you're speaking with. And so obviously the, the, the mentality and the approach to healthcare in Europe is significantly different than it is in the U S at the federal level. And of course, definitely at at the state level. Um, and so when you're getting into the realm of kind of individual, policies i think when you're communicating about those you always just need to think about the context so is this kind of a a single payer system is this kind of a an area where um maybe the viewpoint is the less regulation in healthcare the better are there going to be concerns about um you know uh ethical issues around stem cells that so you all, you constantly right. need to be thinking about that so that you can address people's concerns where they are well steven that was great uh thanks for joining us on this friday uh hopefully you'll have a nice long weekend and um i don't know maybe next time we can do this we can do this in paris <laughs> sounds good mark always happy to go back to, to paris <laughs> but uh, really appreciate the conversation here that was great thanks for joining all right appreciate it